Ted Jackson, and I'd like to welcome everybody to this second meeting, interfaith meeting. Uh, tonight we are going to discuss uh, six faiths, six voices, one earth. And, uh, an interesting and uh, I should hope uh, enlightening discussion about how different faiths deal with creation and how their supreme being, their God, deals with us and how we deal with God's creation here on this earth. I'd like to introduce our moderator for this evening, uh, Reverend Hal Hutchison. He is the rector here at St. John's. Father Hal, as we know and love him here. Uh, Father Hal has been the rector here at St. John's since 2007. And he and his wife Sandy he live here in the Johnson City area. They have three children. I'd like to introduce him, bring him up forward, and we'll continue. First of all, welcome in the name of this congregation and uh, this effort. Um, I think I've got a, an address for each of you. Gary Daw, Director of Libraries at Milligan College, former teacher and pastor in the Mennonite Church Christian Faith Tradition. Still identifying Christian, Gary has, for the last several years, been a student of ancient Taoism. He became attracted to Taoist philosophy in particular because of its naturalist sensibilities. It facilitates a group that studies the Taoist text in the Appalachian Dharma and Meditation Center here in Johnson City, Gulf of Gary. Father Pete Iorio has been a Catholic priest 22 years and is currently pastor at St. Mary's Catholic Church. 38-acre campus, including walking trails, a vegetable garden for the grade school, garden club. Uh, Father Pete is known as, uh, was born in New Jersey, nicknamed the Garden State, and mocked as the armpit of the nation. <laughs> Family moved to Chattanooga in 75. He's lived and studied in Washington, Chicago, Italy. Welcome, Father Pete. Reverend Jacqueline Luck serves as minister of the Holston Valley Univer Unitarian Universalist Church in Gray for nine years and retiring in June to move to New Orleans, the other arm of the nation. I used to live down there too. Okay. The brand name is there. Let's see, active in the United Religions Initiative, local cooperative circle its mission to further peace and goodwill among people of diverse faiths these nine years. Lived in Mississippi, helpful in restoration and, and helped during hurricane, hurricane Katrina event. I was on the other side of Louisiana with Hurricane Rita at, at that time. Welcome, welcome, Jacqueline. Dr. Sharon Malik, welcome. A physician and resident uh, completed at ETSU. Uh, currently working as a hospitalist at Holston Valley Medical Center at Kingsport, representing the Muslim community and it's currently serving as the General Secretary of the Muslim Community of Northeast Tennessee. An active member of the community for 10 years. Involved in various community activities, instrumental in setting up a fl free flu vaccine camp for indigenous people in Tri-Cities four years ago. Other things, he and his wife, Ruma, uh, was also a physician, lived in Johnson City, two sons, eight and four. Well, Dr. Malik. Rabbi Arthur Rutberg served as rabbi for the Nai Shalom congregation in Johnson City, or Tri-Cities, before coming here. Rabbi Rutberg served his community, his country, as U.S. Army chaplain on active duty. In the reserves, in the reserves. Work for promoting interfaith dialogue, cooperation, and understanding. Rabbi Rutberg and his wife, Sarah, reside in Gray. Welcome. Pastor Ed Wolf, retired of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. Instrumental in having the Southeastern Synod create a Green Team Task Force for the Lutheran Church. Currently a co Group leader for the Northeast Tennessee Citizens Climate Lobby Group. Also active in encouraging black, white, and Muslim dialogue. He's also involved in promoting the enactment of Ensure Tennessee for the state. He and his 
his wife Frankie, 12 years in Jonesboro. You have a lot of grandchildren. <laughs> uh, you have before you, panel, uh, some questions. There'll be more to say than can be said in this short time. I think our intention is to hear from each faith group some basics. Where do you start? Where are you going? Uh, based on your understanding from the Almighty uh, in terms of our relationship to the world. And the time. Reverend Love, would you please uh, lead us in an invocation tonight? Be still and know that I am with you, says the Lord. Be still and know I am with you, says the Tao. We are part of nature, and nature is part of us. We are held by the hand of God, and we are the hands of God. Do not try to live as if you are separate. You are not. You are of God, part of the Tao. You are within the landscape. You are elements of the seasons. You are both heaven and earth. Be known for what you are, and make your actions harbingers of a better future. Flow like water round obstacles. Do not batter your head against a brick wall. Flow under it, and when it collapses, you will be long gone. Hold true to God. Rest in the Tao, and you will be carried to where the future needs you. Amen. So to begin with, we'll start with uh, Gary on this end and work our way down. In brief, what does your faith say to its adherents about the care of the earth and creation? I'm going to start by not answering the question, <laughs> but maybe provide some context for, for my participation. And then I'll pick it up at question two uh, with, a, with a little more context. I'm more an avid student of the ancient Taoist philosophical and religious texts than an adherent as such. And I'm also a relative newcomer to the study, having been at it for a little over four years. As a consequence, I cannot and do not presume to speak with any real authority. As Lao Tzu reminds me in chapter 56 of the Tao Te Ching, those who know do not talk, those who talk do not know. It's probably better for me to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> Nevertheless, when approached, I consented to represent the Taoist, or rather a Taoist perspective to the best of my ability. For the majority of my life, my view of reality has been shaped and guided by Western religious and philosophical sensibilities. I became attracted to the study of Taoist text because it conceptualizes reality in a completely different way than what I was familiar with. And yet it did so in a way that was fully coherent and meaningful. This intrigued me greatly. At the risk of tremendous oversimplification, the stance of Taoist ancient Taoists and actually Chinese thought vis-a-vis -vis Western constructs might be schematized by the following statements. Verbs rather than nouns. Actions rather than propositions. Dynamic rather than fixed or static. Concrete. Specific. Local rather than abstract, general, and universal. Multiple perspectives rather than a single totalizing perspective. Experience rather than belief. Contingency, uniqueness, and openness rather than completeness and a quest for conformity and closure. Taoism is an ancient indigenous religion philosophy of China that is at least 2,500 years old. There is no known founder of Taoism, though two of the most familiar names associated with Taoism are Lao Tzu from the 5th or 6th century before the Common Era, presumptive author or compiler of the text called the Tao Te Ching, and 
Chuangzi, presumptive author of at least a core of a text which bears his name. The Tao of Taoism is an ancient Chinese word that can be translated literally as road or path, or metaphorically as way, method, or guide. As such, there are and can be many Tao's, indeed ancient Confucianism and other religions and philosophies in China spoke of Tao. The great Tao in Taoism is not a deity, and it doesn't exist outside of the existing universe, often referred to as heaven and earth. It is not correct to call Tao a creator. Perhaps better source or organizing principle that sustains creation or pure potentiality. From the Roman Catholic tradition, the church teaches uh, an integral ecology, which includes both natural ecology and human ecology. So it's a complete look at who we are and where we live. And it, our teaching comes from the scriptures, both Hebrew and Christian scriptures. And we have to realize that a true ecological approach always becomes a social approach. It must integrate questions of justice in debates on the environment, so as to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. God created the world and all that it contains. And we human beings have a responsibility to care for this beautiful world, and that means that we are to be good stewards of creation. We are faced currently with global environmental degradation. And so we need to address this crisis together as brothers and sisters who live in a common home, which is our planet. The ecological concern is a result of a tragic consequence of unchecked human activity. Due to an ill-considered exploitation of nature, humanity runs the risk of destroying it. And becoming, and becoming, in turn, a victim of this degradation. Some of the issues which we need to address are pollution and climate change, water or the lack thereof, loss of biodiversity, the extinction of plants and animals, the decline in the quality of human life and the breakdown of society, as well as global inequality. Human life is a gift which must be defended from various forms of debasement. It entails profound changes in lifestyles, models of production and consumption, and the established structures of power. The Catholic Church says that we need to promote ecological education and a spirituality of ecological conversion, whereby the effects of the encounter of Christians with Jesus Christ become evident in their relationship with the world around them. To live a virtuous life means that we are protectors of God's handiwork. Thank you, Philippi. Um, I'm in somewhat of the same boat as Gary in that I'm going to address the question from a different angle than, than head on. Um, so, first I think what I need to tell you about Unitarian Universalism is that our faith doesn't tell us things. It is through our individual faith that we come to a sense of conscience and what is to be done. So, uh, we have what's called congregational polity, meaning that our congregations stand uh, separately, as in Baptist churches are also in a congregational polity. And from there, we send our delegates to general assembly, and in general assembly, which uh, we vote on issues of concern, and our study issues, and our issues of conscience and social justice that we want to make primary in the, in the coming year. 
Um, so I guess what we'd say, is we tell our faith how we choose to live this out in the world. Um, I know that sounds kind of strange, but what does hold us together are several things. One are our Unitarian Universalist principles. And to me, what we do is we say we affirm to promote these principles in our lives. They are not free and they can change. Uh, we can vote on the at General Assembly and change them. So like the first one is the inherent worth and dignity of all people. Probably most of us agree with that. But our seventh principle, which was written, which was added to the list in 1984, is respect for the interdependent web of all of existence of which we are a part. That's not really the beginning of our interest in the environment and ecology, but it is our first documented uh, interest. And also, then, we have our sources of our living tradition. And these sources uh, explain where these principles come from. And so, um, I just, so the seventh one, I'm sorry, I can't count very well. The sixth one is spiritual teachings of Earth-centered traditions, which celebrate the sacred circle of life, and instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature. It was added to our statement, our sources, in 1995. And I think that's all I'll say right now about that. First of all, I would like to thank you all for giving us the opportunity to present before you the Islamic viewpoint regarding the earth and its environment. Islam gives great importance to the protection of the earth and its environment. It teaches that God Almighty is the creator of everything, heavens and the earth and everything that lies within it. And we as humans are God's wise parents on this earth and it is our responsibility to protect the earth and its environment. God Almighty says in Quran in chapter 20, 79 verse 30, He says that He spread the earth and brought forth therefrom its water and its pasture and the mountains He has firmly fixed to be a provision and for benefit for you and your cattle. So how can we get benefit from something if we destroy it or if we do not take good care of it. And this point was also greatly emphasized by the Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in a famous hadith in which he said, All of you are shepherds and responsible for your walks and things under your care. So it is our responsibility to take care of these things according to Islam. And it is now up to us that how we fulfill our responsibilities. And Muslims cannot just sit aside anymore and watch from sidelines as a silent observer what is happening to the earth and its environment. They need to become more active and uh, give justice to them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, like nearly everything else in Judaism, the view on uh, the environment and the world is uh, is based in the Torah. Um, Torah, of course, by that I mean the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, the Book of Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They are looked upon as being the most, um, holy, the most directed um, of the books, giving us teaching on how we are to live our lives. And to start with this general statement, the principle in, you know, is essentially that we are, like Father Pete said, stewards of the world. It is our job to take care of the world that we are responsible for taking our part in it, that while God, of course, is the author of creation, we are also, you know, players, we are partners, if you will, in that creation. We have to uh, take care of what's there, because after all, we know that it's not going to be here forever. We understand it's a very finite thing, the world that we live on, 
the planet that we inhabit, and that we have to do our part to make sure it remains for our children, for our grandchildren. We always look forward, we always look ahead, I should say, to the future generations, to what's coming along, and how we <coughs> take care of them, take care of it for them. And so we look upon ourselves as being the ones in whose hands are the, uh, the, the, the good and the bad. It's our job to take care of the world. It's our job not to spoil it, but to cherish it and preserve it and keep it around for the future. Thank you, Rabbi. When I saw the questions that were being asked, I realized I'm representing the Protestant end of the faith. I cannot tell you what we believe. It goes all the way from those who believe, and I have had this said to me, when we had a prayer vigil in Jonesboro, that humanity cannot create climate change. That only God can do that. Only God can change the earth all the way to what you've heard so far. So that's a real challenge. Now in Christianity, of course, and probably a good share of you here are Christians, it is Christ and the cross. Unfortunately, what we have done is separated Christ and the cross from the earth. So I would just like to read one brief, very brief comment, which is one of my favorites, and many of you are familiar with it from the Gospel of John. I won't read the first two verses. All things came into being through the Word. All things. And without the Word, not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him, in the Word, was life. So, from my perspective and from what I read in Scripture, I cannot separate Jesus Christ from the earth or anything that has been created. And with my brother Rabbi Rutberg here, we know from Genesis that we are to keep the earth and we are to be stewards of the earth. But there is a challenge that goes on with some of us Protestants. It's called the word dominion, which some people believe is to do whatever we wish. In fact, if you look into the political arena today, you are hearing about the seven mountains of dominion that come up where humanity can rule. I had a great presiding bishop of the ELCA who had a very dear friend who was a rabbi. And the rabbi said to Mark Hansen, you Christians are strange people. You go out into the world and get questions and come to the scripture to get answers. Now we go to scripture to get questions and go out into the world to get answers. And so that's our struggle. And so I can't speak for Protestantism as a whole. I can't even speak for Lutherans as a whole because there's so many denominations that go from very conservative to very liberal. But we do all hope that Scripture is our rule and norm. And so from my perspective and from many of our perspective, it's how we take that Scripture and wrap it all together rather than use certain texts to get to prove what we want. And from my perspective, what's happening to the earth may be the thing that brings us together. Not just Christians, but all of us. Thank you, panel. Uh, the next question that has been prepared for you 
Are there specific writings and teachings in your faith tradition that point out how the faithful should can be considerate and protective of our environment? Want to keep it going, Ed? Uh, Pastor Wolf? The microphone is here, might as well. Uh, in 1993, that is 22 and a half years ago in August, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America issued this social statement, which all Lutherans know are not binding. It's called Care for Creation, Vision, Hope, and Justice. And it says in there, as members of this church, we commit ourselves to personal lifestyles that contribute to the health of the environment. Many organizations provide materials to guide us in examining possibilities and making changes appropriate to the surgery, which they must swear by. And this document was used so strongly when we had the gay lesbian issue. The paragraph I'm going to read, no one remembers. The people of God are called to care, to the care and redemption of all that God has made. This includes the need to speak on behalf of this earth, its environment and natural resources and its inhabitants. This church expects its ordained ministers will be exemplary, stewards of the earth's resources, and that they will lead this church in the stewardship of God's creation. Those are the written documents. Thank you. As I said, most everything starts with the Torah basis, but from there, of course, it develops and expands and is used and reused and reinterpreted and reapplied. Because the Torah by itself really is kind of inadequate. To start with, though, in the uh, book of Exodus, there's a description about how we are to live in our society, how we are to care for each other, and how we are to protect our own property and protect others from falling into our holes in our property and other kind of, you know, liability and insurance type of issues. But it says, if you see your enemy's animal traveling along the road and it is overly burdened by the weight it carries, you are obligated. You must go to the animal, be it, you know, donkey, horse, whatever it was or is, and help it. You know, fix the, the load. Make it more centered, spread it out, take some stuff off, tie it on better, do something to make it easier on the animal. Regardless of the fact that it belongs to your enemy, that's, that's irrelevant. But our principle here is to make sure that we do an active part in reducing the distress of all living beings. So in that principle right there, what they call the Tsarba Alei Chayim, we are, we are telling our people and ourselves, we must do whatever we can to relieve the stress of any animal, any living being. And that applies, you know, with a pet adoption, you know, to um, you know, just taking care of the, of the world in a better fashion. But then it goes on, of course. Now, what uh, Reverend Ed alluded to was this infamous statement, of course, in Genesis, where God says to Abraham and I'm sorry, to, to Adam and Eve, um, you know, this is the world, you have dominion over it, which is a terrible, terrible term. And the rabbis knew this, and they really were bothered by this term, and so they wrote this very elaborate legend in, in, the, in a collection of legends known as the Midrash Rabbah. And in the Midrash, they tell a story that what God was really saying to Adam was that, listen, Adam, you know, I, I know this world creation thing. I've done it a couple of times already. I tried making a world based totally on justice, and that didn't work because everybody was, you know, messing up. I tried making one based on mercy, and that to work was, was all total anarchy. I made this world based on the balance of justice and mercy. I have made this world in a certain fashion so that you can be responsible for it. Because this is the only world you're going to ever inhabit. This is the last world I'm ever going to make, so it's up to you now to take care of this world and maintain it and preserve it 
and cherish it. You are responsible. So it's not to be understood as having dominion, having the freedom to do whatever you wish to, but it is the obligation to take care, to once again, to be the stewards, to be the ones in charge, to be the ones responsible for the land. But as we move further into Jewish learning, and so we come to the, into the Kabbalists, the Jewish mystics. And they came up with a brilliant, brilliant idea. That creation wasn't something that happened just, you know, in, in a vacuum, if you will. You know, God made it happen, boom, and there it was. But it was a long-term process by which God tried to make the world a certain fashion, but wasn't able to. And as a result, trying to contain this powerful divine light of creation, these vessels that held the light shattered and split them into a million small pieces and burned millions of sparks everywhere. And these sparks and these pieces kind of got embedded into the earth. And it's our job as human beings, in every deed that we do, we are, just, we are to get rid of those pieces and to release the sparks. Because by doing positive, good, righteous, just, and fair actions, we help to complete the process of creation. So what I'm trying to say here is that we are partners in the creation of the world. The creation of the world is not done yet. It's mostly done. But it's not totally done. Because we still do not live in a very perfect world, do we? Not even close. So it's our job as human beings to, to fix it, to repair the world, to make it a better place, to perfect it. The principle to Kunalam says that we cannot just sit idly by. We cannot just stand by the side and watch things happen. We must take a part. We must do our job. We must take responsibility because we are partners in the creation of this world and the world that we live in and the world, hopefully, the world to come as well. So it is up to us to do our part because we will be our partners with God in the process. As I said before, uh, that Islam's Hollywood Quran teaches mankind that God Almighty is the sole creator of everything. Quran tells us that everything which God Almighty has created glorifies God Almighty. So we need to be mindful that how we treat God's creation. We need to protect and preserve the environment and at the same time remind each other to do the same. And it is because God Almighty has appointed us as the, depu as the deputies on, on, on this earth and the Prophet of Islam, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, he has made us shepherds for everything under our care. And there are several verses in Quran and several hadiths which tell us about the relationship of a man with its environment. And I'm going to uh, sequence them in the following fashion. First thing which we need to understand is that God is the creator of everything. And second thing, as I mentioned, that everything that God created glorifies Him. And then man has been appointed as a guardian for everything that has been created on this earth. And God Almighty, the, the next point is that the God Almighty does not love the one who wastes things. And Prophet of Islam gave specific instructions in, in many of his hadiths not to waste natural resources like water, not to cut trees or not to destroy the crops, not to kill animals. Hunting in Islam just for fun or as a game is not allowed. Justified use of natural resources is allowed in Islam and in Islam everything has its specific rights which are well defined in the book of in Quran and in Hadith. So first thing as I mentioned that God is the creator of everything, I will recite a few verses from chapter 27 verses 60 to 62 and this is in relationship uh, in, in context of the relationship between the man and the environment and not as a belief system. Uh, God says, Who has created the heavens and the earth? And who sends down rain from the sky? With it we cause to grow well-planted orchards full of beauty and delight. It is not in your power to cause the growth of the trees in them. Can there be another God besides God Almighty? Nay, they are a people who swerve from justice. 
or who has made the earth firm to live in, made rivers in its midst, set there on mountains immovable, and made a separating bar between the two bodies of flowing water. Can there be another God besides God Almighty? Nay, most of them know not. Or who listens to the distressed when it calls to him, and who relieves its sufferings, and make you, O mankind, inheritors of this earth? Can there be another God besides God Almighty? And then he mentioned in chapter 2, verse 30, when he created Adam, uh, the first human being, he told his angels that I am going to place a wise student on, on this earth. And then he made a man, a guardian on this earth, according to chapter 24, verse 55. My second point was that everything that is created by God Almighty sings the glory of Almighty. It is mentioned in Quran in chapter 64, verse 1, that all that is in the heavens and all that is in the earth glorifies God Almighty. You may have uh, we, uh, the Prophet David, uh, we call him Dawud alayhi salam, he has been mentioned in Quran many times and uh, he, the book of Psalms, the songs of, the songs of uh, Prophet David, that when he would sing the glory of Almighty, everything including the mountains and the birds would sing the glory of Almighty with him. So the point which I'm trying to make is that to destroy or to waste the creation of God Almighty who are constantly glorifying uh, the Almighty, we need to be mindful of how we are going to, to use them. Justified, as I said before, justified use of these things is of course allowed. My next point was that God does not love the one who wastes. He says in Quran, to the mankind in chapter 7 verse 31 that eat and drink but waste not by excess for God Almighty does not love the wasters and the Prophet of Islam Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him he said in a hadith that he saw a, mer a person who was actually making uh, ablution which is the spiritual cleansing of the body parts to, uh, to get ready for the prayer and he apparently was using excess water than what he needed. So he saw that person and he said, what is this? You are wasting water. The man replied, can there be any wastefulness while doing evolution? And the prophet, peace be upon him, he replied, very strong words. He said, yes, even if you are at the bank of a flowing river, still if you are using excess than what, than what you need, it will be the wasting of water. So that was the clear instruction from the Prophet of Islam. Islam puts great emphasis on the rights of everybody. Everything, whether living or non-living, has its rights which are well defined in Islam. Protecting everything on earth is the responsibility and duty of the believers and it is the right of this earth upon us. And then, uh, Regarding the next point, when I uh, mentioned that Prophet of Islam, he has uh, clear instructions not to destroy the trees or cut trees or destroy crops. And he uh, gave this clear instruction in the hadith in which he said that there is none amongst you who plants a tree or sows seeds and then a bird or a person or an animal eats from it but is regarded as a charitable gift from you. So planting tree is not only good and beneficial for the person and the, and the other living beings, but it also uh, beneficial for him in the hereafter that it will be counted as a charity from him. He strictly forbade, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, he strictly forbade not to cut trees, not to kill, kill animals wherever you go. And then he also strictly forbade, as I mentioned, that hunting animals for pleasure or, or for fun is not allowed in Islam. And Muslims have been exercising this for centuries. They realized that preserving everything in nature is, uh, is important. And the Islamic history is uh, filled with, with beautiful examples like this. And I will give you just one example and then I will finish. You might have heard uh, the name of a historical city, uh, the name of which was Fuspat. And uh, uh, it is actually at the same location where the present-day Cairo in Egypt uh, is, is 
currently located. It so happened when the Byzantines, they moved their armies uh, towards Alexandria uh, to attack it, Muslim armies were camped uh, miles away near the bank of the river Nile. So the commander of the Muslim army, he ordered his army to decamp and, and move towards uh, Alexandria to protect it. And while they, they were uh, taking down their tents, uh, they noticed that the tent of the commander was inhabited by a bird, and uh, the bird put up a nest over there. So these are the famous words of the commander, uh, which are recorded in the, in the books of Islamic history, that he told his soldiers to not to uh, disturb the peace of their gentle guest. So that camp was left there. They, they, they went to Alexandria, and when the ca campaign was over, they came back, and the tent was still there. And uh, uh, of course, the bird had gone by that time. So they built the city around their tent. And the city came to be known as Fuspad, which means in Arabic, a tent. And it is present day Cairo. So the, the, that, that famous city was uh, the, uh, a, a bird and its nest, the preservation of which led to the foundation uh, of, of a city. It was a great story, so I thought I would share it uh, with you. So to summarize in the end again, we need to realize uh, the Islamic uh, viewpoint that everything is created by God, everything that is created glorifies God, and a man has been appointed a guardian uh, by God Almighty on this earth, and God Almighty does not love the one who wastes things. Prophet of Islam, he clearly gave instructions not to waste natural resources like water, trees, and or kill animals, and then Justified use of these natural resources is allowed in Islam, and in Islam, everything has its rights, which are clear and well defined. Thank you. I think for clarity, the way I'd like to approach this is I'm going to go back to our sources of our living tradition. We call it Unitarian Universalism a living tradition because it is not static, it is ever changing and growing. Um, and so one of the things I, I, I think for you to understand a little better what I'm, what I'm going to say, I want to I'll just briefly mention these to you. So the sources of our living tradition, direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures which moves us to renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life. Words and deeds of prophetic men and women which challenge us to confront powers and structures of evil with justice, compassion, and the transforming power of love. Wisdom from the world's religions which inspires us in our ethical and spiritual life. Jewish and Christian teachings which call us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors as ourselves. Humanist teachings, which counsel us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science and warn us against idolatries of the mind and the spirit. And then the spiritual teachings of the earth-centered traditions that uh, instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature. The reason I mention that, as you can see, we draw from many sources. I don't have one holy text. We certainly revere the Bible, and I certainly do use the Bible in my teachings uh, at, at times. But at times, as just then, when I was doing the invocation, we draw from doubt, or I almost draw something from Teresa uh, de uh, uh, Adel, thank you, little um, nervous. And I'm, I'm my uh, closing is um, for my sake. So I find myself often uh, seeking guidance in many areas. So I thought instead of holy text, one of the things I would do to you for you is to just read some of the things that throughout time have been written by Unitarians 
and or universalist or Unitarian Universalist after they merged in 1961. So there's Walt Whitman, I don't read all of those, but uh, Emerson, the transcendentalists for the majority of them were Unitarians. Emerson, the majority of them were Unitarians, and um, they were certainly closely associated with nature. Um, in fact, I thought I'd read something from Thoreau. Um, yes, this is from Thoreau's The Main Woods. Strange that so few ever come to the woods to see how the pine lives and grows and spires, lifting its evergreen arms to the light, to see its perfect success, but most are content to behold it in the shape of many broad boards brought to market, and deem that it is its true success. But the pine is no more lumber than man is and to be made into boards and houses is no more its true and highest use than the truest use of a man is to be cut down and made into manure. There is a higher law affecting our relation to pines as well as to men. A pine cut down, a dead pine, is no more a pine than a dead human carcass is a man. Can he who has discovered only some of the values of whale bone and whale oil be said to have discovered the true use of the whale? Can he who slays the elephant for his ivory be said to have seen the elephant? These are petty and accidental users. Just as if a stranger, if, just as if a stronger race were to kill us in order to make buttons of our bones. For everything may serve a lower as well as a higher use. Every creature is better alive than dead. Men and moose and pine trees and he who understands it all right will rather preserve its life than destroy it. And one more quote I thought I'd read from our Unitarian Carl Sagan. The earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes. Settle not life, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the earth is where we make our stand. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than that this distant image of our tiny world, to me it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Those, uh, they summarize a lot of what different ones of us believe because our, our belief is diverse, as I said. Um, I'm not sure if this is the place that I should mention some documents, but uh, it seems to be the longer time. So I thought I would mention that uh, we have several programs within the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations such things as the Green Sanctuary Program, which has been organized since 1989, in which our congregations meet high uh, hurdles, high specifications to become certified as green congregations. And uh, that program has evolved and evolved. It started out as a seventh principle project when they were getting that seventh principle there about preserving uh, our earth focus and um, saving, uh, our understanding our interdependence within the web of life. I thought I'd quickly mention to you 
Uh, we've had, like I said, that Earth Ministry since 89 that has been moving forward. We now have a group called the UU Ministry for Earth, and that's been quite a um, powerful movement within our uh, association of congregations. And their vision statement is, we envision a world in which reverence, gratitude, and care for the living earth are central to the lives of all people. Our purpose is to inspire, facilitate, and support personal, congregational, and denominational practices that honor and sustain the earth and all beings. We, infer, we affirm and promote the seven principles of the UUA, including respect for the interdependent web of all existence, of which we are a part. Although the U that's enough of that. <laughs> Uh, so then, in 2014, we began a process of divesting from fossil fuel within our congregations and uh, within our uh, association, our larger government, governmental body. In 2015, we uh, wrote a strong and compassionate Global Climate Agreement Act for a Livable Climate, and, and that was our action of witness for three years that we worked on that as a association of congregations. So it's across uh, the, the U.S. Uh, in 2016, our study actually <coughs> issued is climate change and environmental mental justice again for our study. That's enough for me. I'm sure since all of you pay attention to the news, you know my answer to this question is that, <laughs> that uh, yes, the Catholic Church does have a specific writing and teaching on the environment. Uh, Pope Francis uh, wrote an encyclical, a teaching document, which has the strongest weight of teaching documents in the Catholic Church just to distinguish it from the most recent document that is making the news called The Joy of Love, that's a post-synodal apostolic exhortation, and it's not as strong a teaching as the encyclical on the environment. The name of the document is called Laudato Si, and it means praise be in English, and it comes from the Italian, um, the first words of the Canticle of Creation written by St. Francis of Assisi. Uh, whom we consider the patron of the environment. And he lived in the 12th and 13th centuries. The encyclical is the most definitive teaching in the Catholic tradition. Laudato Si builds on what the three previous popes have said and written on the environment. And Pope Francis includes some of what they said in the encyclical. It is not addressed to just people of the Catholic Church or the hierarchy but to all people of the world. And so that's very unique. Uh, Pope Francis considers this issue so important that he invites all human beings to dialogue about this issue as it pertains to how all of us live together on earth, our common home. He believes that our Christian perspective has a lot to offer in the dialogue. So this evening of interfaith dialogue is indeed Catholic Church's participation in the care of the earth and creation. And there's a little obedient boy within me that wants to write Pope Francis and says, yes, we're doing what you told us to do. <laughs> the climate is a common good. It belongs to all people, and it is meant for all people. One thing uh, in the teaching document, uh, Catholics are not obliged to believe in man-made global warning, warning. Although Pope Francis clearly does believe it is based on reputable science. He himself believes in it. Whether the earth is getting warmer and the degree to which we may be responsible for that are matters of science, not faith. So the teaching documents have to do with uh, our faith in particular. If Catholics do not believe in man-made global warning, warning, they cannot simply dismiss this encyclical, however. 
because it does address matters of faith and offer a definitive opinion. Honest debate must be encouraged among experts while respecting divergent views, including people from different cultures. Everything is interconnected. We human beings are part of nature. There are resources which are not adequately distributed upon this earth. <coughs> there are many resources which are wasted. Uh, he says that a third of all food is discarded, and whenever it is thrown out, it is as if it were stolen from the table of the poor. The de deterioration of the environment affects the most vulnerable people on the planet. For example, the depletion of fishing reserves especially hurts small fishing communities without the means to replace those resources. Water pollution affects the poor who cannot buy bottled water. Rises in sea level mainly affect impoverished coastal communities who have nowhere else to go. There is a disproportionate and unruly growth of many cities which have become unhealthy to live in, not only because of pollution caused by toxic emissions, but also as a result of urban chaos, poor transportation, and visual pollution and noise. We were not meant to be inundated by cement, asphalt, glass, and metal, and deprived of physical contact with nature. Fresh drinking water is an issue of primary importance because it is indispensable for human life. Access to safe, drinkable water is a basic uh, universal human right. In the Judeo-Christian tradition, the word creation has a broader meaning than nature, for it has to do with God's loving plan in which every creature has its own value and significance. Nature is usually seen as a system which can be studied, understood, and controlled, whereas creation can only be understood as a fit from the outstra... A, um, uh, creation can only be understood as a gift from the outstretched hand of the Father of all and as a re reality illuminated by love, which calls us together into universal communion. God's love is the universal moving force in all created things. So I'm going to read a number of excerpts from Tao Te Ching, which uh, suggest um, human participation in the environment implicitly uh, as a reflection of a cosmology which involves humanity and internal uh, cultivation um, of the, uh, the interior landscape uh, and its reflection in the external landscape. So I'm going to read a couple of excerpts from I'm going to read a couple of excerpts which describe the cosmology. Chapter 25. Something mysteriously formed, born before heaven and earth, in the silence and the void, standing alone and unchanging, ever present and in motion. Perhaps it is the mother of 10,000 things. I do not know its name. Call it Tao. For lack of a better word, I call it great. And chapter 42. The Tao begot one, one begot two, two begot three, and three begot the 10,000 things. The 10,000 things carry yin and embrace yang. They achieve harmony by combining these forces. So one possible interpretation here is that Tao as source uh, begets what is called Qi, the fundamental matter energy of the universe. And Qi uh, then moves and circulates and then 
the heavy chi settles and becomes earth, and the light chi rises up and becomes heaven. And uh, right in the middle, the balance between yin and yang is the human uh, species. And so we are uh, integral to the cosmology of, of, of creation itself from a Taoist perspective. And then uh, from these platforms, if you will, come the 10,000 things, which is uh, a way of saying all phenomenal and living beings that we see and experience on earth and in the heavens. Chapter 29. Do you think you can take over the universe and improve it? I do not believe it can be done. The universe is sacred. You cannot improve it. If you try to change it, you will ruin it. If you try to hold it, you will lose it. So sometimes things are ahead, and sometimes they are behind. Sometimes breathing is hard, sometimes it comes easily. Sometimes there is strength, and sometimes weakness. Sometimes one is up, and sometimes down. Therefore, the sage avoids extremes, excess, and complacency. Chapter 30. Whenever you advise a ruler in the way of Tao, counsel him not to use force to conquer the universe. For this would only cause resistance. Thorn bushes spring up wherever the army has passed. Lean years follow in the wake of a great war. Just do what needs to be done. Never take advantage of power. Chapter 48. In the pursuit of learning, every day something is acquired. In the pursuit of Tao, every day something is dropped. Less and less is done until non-action is achieved. When nothing is done, nothing is left undone. The world is ruled by letting things take their course. It cannot be ruled by interfering. And then chapter 80, which some take as a sort of a utopian vision of Vasa, but I think there are other um, applications to this text as well. A small country has few people, though there are machines that can work 10 to 100 times faster than man, they are not needed. The people take death seriously and do not travel far. Though they have boats and carriages, no one uses them. Though they have armor and weapons, no one displays them. Men return to knotting of rope in place of writing. Their food is plain and good, their clothes fine but simple, their homes secure. They are happy in their ways. Though they live within sight of their neighbors, and the crowing cocks and barking dogs are heard across the way, yet they leave each other in peace while they grow old and die. Thank you all. <coughs> uh, as I listen to your presentations, I, I hear a, a thread of resonance through them all, that the divine has given us a place to live and a uh, the heart to honor that which we have been given. But I believe in my understanding of human nature that uh, we don't always follow the best courses. Our next question is about how a faithful um, strayed from the teachings about the environment and the earth. Um, we talk about sometimes seven deadly sins and corresponding heavenly virtues with balance. Um, so there's a combination of question here. I'd like to combine the next two into, into one response for each of you before we get into what are we going to do in, in the Tri-Cities area together. And that is uh, 
not every sin in your particular tradition, but where have the people of your faith sometimes strayed from the ways that were given to walk with God and with each other? What is the way to, uh, that that has happened? And then at the same time, what might we, what might you as as uh, leaders in your faith counsel your your peers and counsel others uh, to counteract that uh, strain, that sin? What virtues might you counsel in that direction, uh, Doctor Lee? Okay. I think that, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, the, the main reason that the adherence of the faith has gone astray is basically the lack of knowledge and lack of the will to acquire knowledge is the is the main reason that the faithful are not mindful of protecting the earth and its environment. Muslims have stopped taking guidance from Quran, which is the book of guidance for all. And Muslims have stopped following in the footsteps of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, who is the role model for all. And they did not need any new resolution or any new statement from the mosque. Their Quran taught them 14 centuries ago all these things which I mentioned before. And if they would have known that God does not love the one who is wasteful, they would not have wasted water. If they would have known that everything glorifies God Almighty, they would not be so unmindful of destructing what, what so far has been done to the world. And the other thing which I uh, uh, think is uh, uh, kind of related to this is the worldly temptations and the desire for money among our corrupt leaders uh, that the forests uh, and the natural habitats of the animals are being destroyed uh, not only in the Muslim lands but almost in the whole world. They have lost the realization that destroying nature for money is a grave sin. Killing animals and destroying their habitats is forbidden in Islam. Wasting natural resources like water is not allowed in Islam. I just gave you the example that even for a highly spiritual act of doing evolution, if you are wasting water, he did not allow it. And if Muslims uh, just follow this simple rule that these acts, yet they are beneficial for themselves, are being seen as something for which they can bring the love of the Creator or the approval of the of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, they would not be so unmindful of wasting all these things. Just to illustrate an example, an average person when he takes a shower, 10 minute shower, he uses 20 gallons of water. If he is mindful of all these things, he can probably do that in half of the time, in 5 minutes, and I think he will be still achieve the same level of cleanliness. So they don't realize that by doing these simple things, like for example, clothing the, uh, the faucet while brushing their teeth, uh, or wasting so many, uh, so much food in the restaurants and at other places, uh, just like uh, Father Pete mentioned that probably half of the world is can be fed by the food which is being wasted in the restaurants and, and other places in the world. Uh, I mentioned uh, a hadith in which Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said that planting trees is an act of charity. So it is not going to be beneficial for you in this world, but also in the in the hereafter. And uh, I, I feel uh, happy now that uh, just recently, uh, the country from where I belong, Pakistan, the government announced that they are going to plant one billion trees uh, over the course of next five years. So far, 110 million trees have already been planted, uh, and uh, this this uh, project has been praised by the uh, wildlife uh, World Wildlife Fund for having a staggering success rate of 85 percent against an international success rate of uh, 50 percent. Uh, I hope and I pray that uh, other countries uh, all over the world uh, do the same uh, to, to preserve the nature and, and its environment. Uh, uh, we're going to go with that. Dr. Wolf, we're going to jump around here. I'd like to read something that I 
posted on Facebook, I think on Ginny and on a couple others, by a gentleman named Gus Speth, who's an environmentalist attorney. I used to think the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that with 30 years of good science, we could address those problems. But I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and empathy. And to deal with those, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we good scientists don't know how to do that. There's a story that I heard a long time ago that if you remember the story of Job and Satan challenging God, that all the terrible things that happened to Job and Job did not break from his faith. Satan came back to God and said, now give him everything he wants and see how faithful he is. And that's part of our problem, I think. In Genesis, is kind of the crux for me of the whole challenge. Humanity wanted to be in control. And because of that, we are facing what we are doing today, and every one of us, including everyone in this room, wants some kind of control over life. I can only speak for myself that somewhere it dawned on me, not in my brain, but in my heart, that life is not about me. It's about God. And what I've been admired so much of my Muslim friends is that everything they do is to the glory of God. Not to the glory of myself. I don't know how to change that. Now, I do know that in my faith system and my belief in Jesus Christ that when he died on the cross he did not die just for me. What he did do is show all of us that humanity is basically violent. And I don't mean just in war or putting a man on a cross. Removing mountains, blowing up things in order to get at the minerals, damming up rivers and everything so that they can get the water they want, pumping chemicals into the ground so we can get more oil. I have become familiar with a book, and I haven't read it much, but it's called Enough is Enough. And it isn't going to change until you and I and every one of us realize our whole life system has to change. We cannot take everything we want and use it to our benefit. That this earth belongs to God, and I believe every one of us up here in this room have the same God. We just have a different way of experiencing it. And what I've heard tonight is every one of us in one way or another has said the glory belongs to God. However we call God, however we respond to God. And the other part is, in my faith, it's all about relationship. Whether that's relationship with God, relationship with one another, or a relationship with the earth. And the strangest thing is, it's called love. And somewhere in my life travel, someone told me that the opposite of love is control. Because God would not even control humanity when they picked that fruit off the tree. He let them do what they thought they needed to do. So how do we change it? 
it isn't going to be simple, but it's going to be for us, as I said in my beginning comment, that maybe because of the Earth's challenge, we'll start realizing we've got to live together. And we've got to respect one another for our religion. We've got to respect one another for how we perceive one another. And we've got to respect each other by listening and then respect this Earth that has been such an incredible gift to us. Thank you, Ed. Um, first, I find it kind of humorous, the question, how the faithful straight from the teachings I mean, if they truly were faithful, they wouldn't have strayed, right? <laughs> they would have remained uh, you know, connected to the old principles of faith. Um, I really don't think the issue is faith, to be honest with you. I want to show you a brief story. Um, it happened a few weeks back, a couple months actually. Uh, every Sunday morning we have Sunday school for the students of our, our, our synagogue. And uh, we always have, you know, snack time for the kids. We all stand around. And the kids go off to their room to do their kid thing and have their snack, and the adults stay back in the kitchen. And, and I was appalled by what I saw happen. I saw two people who I considered to be fairly intelligent, you know, teachers in the, con in the congregation, in, in the school. One person, you know, drank his bottle of water, put the cap back on, threw it in the garbage bag. I said, what are you doing? What, what, what's wrong, what's wrong? No, no, you don't, you don't do that. You take the cap off and you recycle it. We don't waste things here. Because after all, that whole story about Adam teaches us a principle. Baal Tashki, do not waste, do not squander things. Next thing I see another teacher, we were all eating this, you know, this cheese and crackers, and there was a piece of cheese on, on a plate. She figured, well, we're all done. She dumped it. What are you doing? You don't waste things, you don't squander food. My God. You save it. You know, put it in the refrigerator, use it the next day, two days later, whatever it is. You don't just squander like that. I mean, we teach the kids these lessons. We teach them the commandments, you know. Do not waste. God says, don't waste. You know, cherish the earth. Don't waste. Protect it. Take care of it. Yet the adults have forgotten this. And I think the problem probably is that living in our society as we do, and the society has that properly, you know, says it's all based upon, you know, me, 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 you know, greed, taking what you want, and never considering the consequence, never considering the rest of the world, the natural world, the physical world, as well as human beings in the world as well, will also need to eat and to drink and to live properly. We take it all for ourselves and don't even consider the consequences. I mean, I think that's what's happening today with the whole global warming issue. People are, not, are saying, no, no, it's not real, it's not real because they don't understand that to every action there's a consequence. They may not see it right away, but it's there. And I don't really know how we can probably teach people this. I mean, do we sit them down to, you know, to lectures every single day and show them, you know, the process of what happens when you throw, you know, a, 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 a plastic bottle into the garbage can? What it does to the environment, how it messes up the landfill, how it destroys the environment for, you know, ages upon ages to come? I don't, I don't think the faith is the answer. I really don't. Even though all of our faiths here are teaching the same basic things. Don't waste, don't squander, protect, take care, cherish the universe, cherish the environment. Love God, because I love God, I love God's creation. And yet, people still do this because they're just not seeing, you know, the consequences. They're not seeing what this really, really means to the world. And I, I honestly, I'm, I'm not sure quite how to get that across. You know, um, I guess more... Well, this is the next question. Okay, we'll put it. Right. Come back to that. Thank you, Rabbi. Father Pete, you want to take the next one? I agree with what's been said. Um, just uh, was thinking about ways in which we can address it. A um, couple of things. Uh, last summer we had an event with uh, our parish youth uh, and um, Wesley Methodist Church youth combined with a group that came down from Chicago and uh, we planned an event together where we went up Rome Mountain just to enjoy the beauty of where we live. And it was an awesome experience for some of our kids who have never been up there, but also for um, especially the kids from Chicagoland. So just be deliberate about taking young people, especially who are always looking down at their phones and all that stuff, their electronics, to appreciate it 
enjoy the beauty of creation, to pay attention to those things. Last Sunday, we took our uh, confirmation class, the youth minister and I, up tip-top um, Buffalo Mountain here on retreat preparing for confirmation. And 13 of them, not all of them were in great shape, most of them outran me, but they really enjoyed it. All of them came back with an appreciation of the grandeur of God and especially the, the beauty of the place and where we live. Another thing that I have done, I think that it's, it sometimes comes down to in your face strange uh, ways of giving an example. For example, I consider myself a garbage picker. Some of my people here know that they have seen me at parish events where we have, um, uh, after a parish dinner or something, and I go to the garbage. Father, what are you doing? Picking out the plastic and the stuff, the aluminum to recycle. Oh, you shouldn't be doing that. Let me do it. Give it. So now, after having done it for a few times over the years, they're more conscious of, conscious of it, and they, you know, know that Father is not going to uh, <laughs> be happy or he'll go through it or, you know. So they're mindful. It's a way of teaching people to be attentive to what we need to um, take care of. Um, also another thing, uh, we have great people in our parish community who are very strong about, you know, not using styrofoam and throwaway things. And, um, uh, so I think we have started to get this mentality, uh, and I'm glad that I have a, a wonderful associate pastor who's um, working with our Hispanic community, especially to uh, be conscious of that and not buy and use that stuff. So little bit, little by little, um, those are some of the things. Another thing uh, is we live on a beautiful campus. We have lots of land. And I was approached by, and we are going to, uh, by one of our parishioners who want to start a community garden so that we can raise vegetables to help those in our community who are needy. Uh, we already have a uh, food pantry, but I also think that um, our collaborations together, uh, what Ginny has done for us uh, with our energy assessment and um, the great changes that we've been making over the years to be more energy efficient and conscious and uh, raise that uh, among our membership has been wonderful. So, and we'd be willing to share uh, what we've learned and done with other people. So. so, Brother Pete, I'm glad you mentioned that about Jenny because that was one of the points I wanted to make too, that we've been, we've worked with Jenny from its inception really. I was on the original board and I couldn't help but bring our award, <laughs> so I brought one, that the congregation got in 2012 from Jenny. And we've also had the congregational assessment and have been working to save energy. In fact, with that assessment, what, what happens is you're given a grant of $500, which you are to pay back from the money that you save on your utility bills. And we had saved $500 uh, well before the year was out uh, and paid our 500 back right away. So that is something that all of our congregations could be doing is greening uh, in every way we can and recycling. When I arrived at Holston Valley, they had already started um, you know, we've got the recycling, the garbage, and the plastic, and the tent, and all of that separate. And they had remodeled the kitchen, and they have a commercial washer so they could use all ceramic or glassware and uh, coffee cups. We don't use styrofoam. Um, I'm not saying that we're perfect, <laughs> so maybe that's where we could improve. We could get a little better with what we're doing, but. They have all, all, since I've known this congregation, that has been a priority. In fact, I, I often joke that uh, Unitarian Universalists are tree hoes, meaning that we love the environment, we love beauty, the beauty of nature. In fact, in my services, uh, some of you may have uh, 
uh, a lower attendance in your worship services on days of bad weather, but I always joke, if the sun's shining and it's a beautiful day, those, our attendance is going to be lower that day. So they'll come, the weather is unbelievable. Uh, they'll be there. <laughs> but if it's, it's gorgeous, we like to be outside too. So another thought I had, um, well, while I'm talking about Jenny, I would also talk about opportunities. <coughs> and I've started using, instead of interfaith, I've started using the word interreligious so that people will be clear that I'm speaking of different religions getting together, not just different Christians, but different religions getting together and doing work. We all know our numbers make us stronger. And the more people we can get involved in things like this and other journey activities. Um, and uh, URI events, United Religions Initiative, that would all be good. So I've spoken about a lot of things. Um, and I've made clear, I think, that Unitarian Universalists have a diversity of belief. And so one of the ways I was just speaking today to a, a, a class of for new members, and I was saying when people ask you what we believe and all that, maybe one of the easier things to say is we have diverse beliefs, but this is what I believe. And so I thought I share some of that about what I believe. Um, all of our traditions have a more mystical practice. I almost chose something from St. Francis while I read it. <coughs> mystical brother, son, sister moon. I know the Sufis are more mystical part of Islam. I know the, uh, in the Jewish tradition, there are many mystical parts. But I'm missing a name right now. Uh, sure, Kabbalah. Thank you. <coughs> I love studying the Kabbalah. And certainly there are more mystical traditions, practices within all forms of Christianity. Uh, some of us think that Jesus was an extremely mystical uh, human being. And um, so this mystical thought that I'm having is for me, there is a great unity of all. We've spoken of interdependence. We have that interdependence. If some of us are doing poorly, we all are doing poorly. Um, and there is, so, so where I'm trying to get with this is, if we could identify a little more with that more mystical part of our tradition that does not see separation between people or between things that sees all of the all of creation as one, which is where I am, then I think that there will be less of this kind of see of seeing the other and seeing divisions among us instead of understanding how much we have in common and how much we have in common with our planet and our the, all beings and all creatures. In all of the earth, we are all one. So to share from the problem side, the uh, list of sins that have been enumerated in other traditions are also reflected here. Chapter 46 of the Tao Te Ching. When the Tao is present in the universe, the horses haul manure. When the Tao is absent from the universe, War horses are bred outside the city. There is no greater sin than desire, no greater curse than discontent, no greater misfortune than wanting something for yourself. Therefore, he who knows that enough is enough will always have enough. Another problem is in, in that Taoism recognizes is the denying of the innate nature of each being and each creature. And so I'll read a, I want to read a, a short story from uh, the Zhuangzi uh, called Horses' Hooves. Horses have hooves so their feet can grip on frost and snow and hair so that they can withstand the wind and cold. They eat grass and drink water. They buck and gallop. For this is their innate 
for this is the innate nature of horses. Even if they had great powers and magnificent calls, they would not be interested in them. However, when Polo came on the scene, he said, I know how to train horses. He branded them, cut their hair and their hooves, put halters on their heads, bridled them, hobbled them, and shut them up in stables. Out of ten horses, at least two or three would die. Then he makes them hungry and thirsty, gallops them, races them, parades them, runs them together. He keeps before them the fear of the bit and ropes, and behind them the fear of the whip and crop. Now more than half the horses are dead. Generation after generation has said Polo is good at controlling horses, and the same nonsense is sprouted by those who rule the world. I think that someone who truly knows how to rule the world would not be like this. The people have a true nature. They weave their cloth, they farm to produce food. This is their basic virtue. They are all one in this, not separated, and it is from heaven. Thus, in an age of perfect virtue, the people walk slowly and solemnly. They see straight and true. In times such as these, the mountains have neither paths nor tunnels. On lakes, there are neither boats nor bridges. All life lives with its own kind, living close together. The birds and the beasts multiply in their flocks and herds. The grass and trees grow tall. It is true that at such a time, the birds and beasts can be led around without ropes, and birds' nests can be seen with ease. I'll stop there. The, um, the solution uh, from the Taoist perspective is the mystical way, uh, as, as uh, Jacqueline mentioned. And uh, it's through inner cultivation and according with the natural patterns of the Tao and recognizing the, the innate nature of every one of the 10,000 things that we find our salvation. And I'll read uh, a text chapter 16 of the Tao Te Ching, an excerpt from the chapter. Empty yourself of everything. Let the mind become still. The 10,000 things rise and fall while the self watches their return. They grow and flourish and then return to the source. Returning to the source is stillness, which is the way of nature. Fonza has another story about the innate nature. Carpenter Shi was on his way to Qi when he came to a place called Chu Yang, where he saw an O tree which was venerated as the home of the spirits of the land. The tree was so vast that a thousand oxen could hide behind it. It was a hundred spans round and it soared above the hill to 80 feet before it even began to put out branches. There were 10 such branches from any one of which an entire boat could be carved. Masses of people came to see it, giving the place a carnival atmosphere. But Carpenter Shi didn't even look round, just went on his way. His assistant looked at it with great intensity and then chased after his master and said, since I first took up my axe and followed you, I have never seen wood such as this. Sir, why did you not even glance at it or stop, but just keep on going? He said, silence, not another word. The tree is useless. Make a boat from it and it would sink. Make a coffin and it would rot quickly. Make some furniture and it would fall to pieces. Make a door and it would be covered in seeping sap. Make a pillar and it would be worm-eaten. This wood is useless and good for nothing. This is why it has lived so long. There's one thing we haven't said today, and that's 
to become active. I know of two organizations. There's the Citizens Climate Lobby that has a positive, loving approach to being active in the community through letter writing op-eds and talking to your legislative people. There's also a group growing out of uh, St. Mary's, an advocacy group that has been de developed by the Friends, the Quakers, and they're working toward advocacy. We can sit here all night and talk and philosophize and internalize and everything else, but we live in a world. And if we really strongly believe in this incredible love we have for the earth, we need to let people know. Well, that sort of leads to one last brief comment from each of you. As the leaders in our community, faith leaders, what would you envision as something that would be visible in our community uh, that we could do together? What would be a sign that we're working together? We're not going to solve any problems tonight. We're, we're, we're engaging in conversation, which I think has been very rich. But in uh, uh, less than a minute, can you give us a, a, a piece of a vision that would say, this would be a sign that we're working together on this effort? Um, I'm not sure about how it would all work. I just know, you know, I've been here um, since July, and I've been personally frustrated by the, the lack of, you know, of recycling facilities or recycling uh, as a regular, you know, pick up wherever you live. It's very hit and miss. And I don't really know what we can do that as a faith community, but perhaps we could, we could, you know, bring together a strong recycling effort. Now, certainly through Junie's involved, I would, I would imagine. Okay. That's something we could all take part in. We could all have little, our, own, our own, you know, stations that are at our places of worship, perhaps. We'll bring that to the city. Okay. I, I echo uh, the suggestions which have been uh, made so far, and uh, I think uh, what we can do is uh, start uh, uh, from small steps, you know, doing little things, saving water, uh, you know, uh, recycling plastic, saving food, and all those other things. And, and I think there is a great need for uh, events like this uh, to bring awareness uh, to the people, and, and together we work, more uh, we can achieve. And as a representative of the Muslim community, we assure you of uh, our support in all these uh, uh, projects, and we would like to be involved uh, in it. And as a, as a closing, I will uh, just make one statement, uh, and I think if we all follow this, uh, this uh, very uh, clear uh, and, and, and useful statement, and I will make it in Arabic, and don't worry, I will translate it in English too. Uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he, he said in a, in a hadith, Al Khalqu Ayalullahi, which means that all the creation is household of God. Fa Ahabul Khalqi Ilallahi Man Ahsana Ila Ayalihi. And the most light by God Almighty in mankind is the one who is good to his household. And we know that household includes everything. Not only the humans, but it includes the animals, your, your garden, your trees, your water sources, the flora and fauna, your house, everything. Thank you. Perhaps we could come together, especially um, with the young people from our communities, and have an event uh, such as Youth for a Greener City, something like that, to get the young people who have such vision and energy and passion to put their gifts at the service of our town. I would simply um, uh, echo what Dr. Mock is, has said in, in saying that events such as this, I think, communicate to our larger community that people of multiple faiths and religions can gather together and work for a common goal, appreciating from our own traditions, uh, adding to the richness of that, but also what's often lacking in conversation Today, at many levels, is, is the affirmation of our common of our common purpose. It seems to me the obvious thing is that we could participate more in Jimmy Green Interfaith Network Inc. Um, and we don't have to invent the wheel. Jimmy has all sorts of programs and projects and all that. And if we and our congregations would show up more and participate, um, it is. Interreligious, though it says interfaith, and um, seems 
Thank you all for being here today. Thank you all for being here today. You shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Now we can clap.